Now, let's look at the human memory architecture. We store some information temporarily in our short-term memory. The short-term memory holds information for less than a minute, then gradually it disappears. If we want to retain the information, we need to make an effort to learn it. Short-term memory space is limited in size. It holds only about seven items. Now, let's look at long-term memory. This memory is very powerful. It stores information for months, even for years, and it can store large quantities of information. Our long-term memory helps us to remember events and things that happened in the past. It helps us to remember language and how to use and understand words. And it also helps us to remember physical skills, how to swim, and ride a bicycle. In conclusion, if you read or hear anything for the first time, it goes into short-term memory, and after reproduction of that information, it is turned into a long-term memory. The lecture was about human memory architecture. The lecturer stated that our short-term memory is limited in size, it is temporary and stores up to seven items. If we take efforts to learn it, then it is stored as a long-term memory. The lecturer also said that long-term memory is powerful, and it helps us to remember language and skills. The speaker concluded by saying that any new information is a short-term memory, and after efforts of reproduction, it becomes the long-term memory. There are many lifestyle diseases in the modern world. One of the most concerning is diabetes. It is possible to control diabetes with drugs, but there is no cure. There are things, however, that people, especially young people, can do to avoid it. If they are overweight, they should try to lose weight. They should also watch what they eat and try to avoid foods high in fats and sugars. People should exercise regularly by jogging, swimming, or doing aerobics. In addition, they should walk or cycle more instead of traveling by car or bus. If people change to this healthier lifestyle, we may be able to stop the rise in diabetes in the future. The lecture was about the measures to stop spreading diabetes. The lecturer stated that diabetes can be controlled using drugs, but can't be cured. The lecturer also said that young people should avoid foods high in fats and sugars, and reduce their weight if they are overweight. People should do regular exercise by swimming, jogging and walking, instead of using their car. The speaker concluded by saying that, if people switch to healthier food choices and exercise more, we may be able to stop the spread of this modern lifestyle disease.
Employers want to get the best work out of their employees, so they need to help them find some job satisfaction. Employers can challenge staff members by setting them new goals. They can also offer development opportunities so staff can learn new skills. It's a good idea to give positive feedback to staff when they complete tasks effectively. This will make them feel valued. If a staff member is worried about an aspect of their job, the employer should make arrangements for that person to speak privately to a manager outside their team. This manager should try to establish a good relationship with the staff member. Many employers see the positive side of this system. By listening to the employee's concerns and providing support, they can quickly address an issue before it becomes too big and starts to affect their work. The lecture was about achieving higher output and job satisfaction at the workplace. The lecturer stated that employers can set new goals, provide development opportunities and provide feedback. The lecturer also said that an employer should arrange a meeting privately if they are concerned. The speaker concluded by saying that, if the issue is solved earlier, it will not become a big problem in the future and stop affecting employee performance. People like to read in many different places, for example in a park, on a bus, or in a car. This is because books, newspapers, magazines, and so on, are easy to carry. We also read in many different ways, and at different speeds. Sometimes we read quickly. We just want to get the general idea from a newspaper article, a report, or a book in a bookshop. Perhaps we want to know what it is about, or if it is interesting or important. We call this type of reading, skimming. We also read quickly to get a particular piece of information, such as a date, a telephone number, or the name of a restaurant. This is called scanning. We scan timetables, telephone directories, dictionaries, and web pages. At other times we need to read more carefully. For example, we read a textbook, an article, or a report to understand everything. This is called intensive reading or study reading. Then we read slowly and check the meaning. We use our dictionaries a lot to help us. The lecture was about reading styles and habits. The lecturer stated that people like to read at various places and sources at different speeds. The lecturer also said that people either skim or scan to get a quick idea about the article. 
Alternatively, to understand something thoroughly, people do intensive reading or study reading. The speaker concluded by saying that, all types of reading styles are according to our needs and priority. There are treasures of happiness all around us, but the problem is that we only appreciate them when something terrible happens. Usually, when we become sick, we appreciate our health. When we lose something, we appreciate it more. But we don't need to wait. If we develop a habit of being grateful, we can significantly increase our levels of happiness. Research by Robert Emmons and Mike McAuliffe observed people who kept a gratitude journal each night where they wrote at least five things they're thankful for in life. The results showed that these people are happier, more optimistic, more successful, more likely to achieve their goals, physically healthier, it strengthens our immune system, and more generous to others. Keeping a gratitude journal is something that takes just three minutes a day, but has significant and positive results. The lecture was about the importance of keeping a gratitude journal. The lecturer stated that we appreciate things when we are in an adverse situation. The lecturer also said that the levels of happiness can be increased by appreciating things around us. Every day, writing five things that we are thankful for in life. The speaker concluded by saying that, keeping a gratitude journal can positively impact on people's attitude, their health, and general well-being. We all know how surprise makes us feel dizzy and causes our hands to go cold. But why do we feel surprise? Well, there are actually two main kinds. First-hand surprise happens when there's a difference between a new piece of information and a previous knowledge. For example, someone knocks on my door and it's my best friend, who I believe is living in Berlin, and I'm surprised because I didn't expect to see him. The second kind of surprise goes deeper. It's caused when an event contrasts with my long-term knowledge and expectations. If, for example, a police officer enters my house to arrest me when I've done nothing wrong, I'm surprised, not just because I didn't expect this event. The event destroys some strong beliefs I had that the law is fair. So I feel surprised because of a failure in my knowledge.
The lecture was about how surprises affect our life. The lecturer stated that there are two kinds of surprise. The first one adds new information to our previous knowledge, and the second one completely contradicts the pre-assumed beliefs. The lecturer also said that the second kind of surprise is deeper and affects us profoundly. The speaker concluded by saying that surprise occurs when something unexpected happens or there is a failure in the knowledge. Have you ever seen a situation where an animal is repeatedly put in a negative situation that it can't escape? Eventually, the animal will stop trying to avoid the source of the problem. Instead, it starts behaving as if it's completely helpless to change the situation. Well, this state of limited control is called learned helplessness. Now, the animal has opportunities to escape from this environment, but the learned helplessness prevents it taking any action. We've seen it in a number of different animal species, but we also see this behaviour in people. So, for example, a child who does poorly on maths tests will quickly begin to feel that nothing he does will have any effect on his performance. Then, later, when that same child is faced with any maths task, he's probably going to experience that same feeling of helplessness on another occasion. What this means is that small problems can often become much worse because of this. The lecture was about a negative situation called learned helplessness. The lecturer stated that learned helplessness prevents an animal to take any action against adversity. The lecturer also said that this state of limited control also exists in humans, and it affects their ability to outperform their helplessness. The speaker concluded by saying that small problems become much worse due to learned helplessness. Regular smiling has lots of health benefits, especially when the smile uses muscles around the eyes and you show your teeth. This kind of smiling can reduce stress, lower blood pressure and make you feel happier because feel-good chemicals are released by your brain. But smiling does not only benefit you, it can also spread happiness to other people. Researchers in Sweden asked participants in a study to look at images of faces. When the participants saw a happy face, they moved their own smile muscles. When they saw a sad face, they moved the same muscles they use when they're unhappy and frown. Most of the time, of course, um, they had no idea that they were moving these muscles, so smiling has physical and mental benefits for you, but it can also provide the same benefits to people who you smile at.
The lecture was about the importance and health benefits of a smile in our life. The lecturer stated that feel-good chemicals are released when a person smiles and other people are benefited as well. The lecturer also said that a research in Sweden showed that sad and happy faces use the same muscles of our face. The speaker concluded by saying that smiling has physical and mental benefits to both the person who smiles and the one gets smiled at. A study in the United States showed that traffic congestion annually costs the economy up to $1,000 per driver. Part of this is because people's time is wasted when they are stuck in traffic. They are often late for work and their time is not used in a productive way. So what can be done about the problem of traffic congestion in cities? Well. Urban planners have tried a variety of strategies. In London, for example, drivers pay a charge to use the roads in the city centre. A lot of people think this is a rather extreme solution, but some cities are looking for an even more advanced approach. Urban planners in places such as Nagoya in Japan are trying to redesign the cities so that they can function without the use of any private cars at all. The lecture was about the problem of traffic congestion and the solution to reduce traffic. The lecturer stated that traffic jams are expensive because people's time is not used in a productive way while stuck in a traffic jam. The lecturer also said that urban planners charge people to use cars in London and in Japan, redesigning a city is considered as a solution. The speaker concluded by saying that, if people stop using their cars in the main city, it will increase productivity.